Back with us this morning is the chair of the House Budget Committee, Congressman John Yarmuth, Democrat of Kentucky. Congressman, as you know, the president unveiled a $6 trillion budget request for fiscal year 2022. Yesterday, we had on the program Republican Kevin Hearn, and here's what he had to say about the president's proposal. We spend a trillion dollars a year right now on programs to help those uh, who can't help themselves, that need help, need a handout. Uh, uh, many of us in America, myself included, early on in life uh, needed that help. But we also ought to be helping those folks uh, move on to jobs. And so uh, the American Jobs Plan, as uh, the president uh, has pushed, and the American Family Plan, as, as you just referenced, the American Family Plan is over $4 trillion of, of spending. The American Jobs Plan that was just uh, pushed forward was, is over a, million, a trillion five. And so when you look at these two programs together, along with some other things going on, we're talking about a $6 trillion budget. And the American taxpayer has just said enough is enough. Even Democrats now are sending letters to the leaders of both the House and the Senate saying, we have got to get our fiscal house in order. So, uh, Chair Yarmuth, I mean, how can we spend $6 trillion and all the other money that President Biden wants to spend? How can we afford it? Uh, we can't afford it because uh, we determine how much money's in the system and, and, the, and the, at the federal level. Um, you know, the government, the federal government is not like any other user of currency, not like any household, any business, any state or local government. Um, we issue our own currency and we can spend enough to meet the needs of the American people. Uh, is, the only constraint being that we, have to, we do have to worry about inflation uh, from that spending. Now, you know what uh, so many people say, well, we've been, you know, we've got so much debt and our grandchildren are going to have, it's going to be on their backs and so forth. That's not the way it works. And, and I think the American people need an education about how the money monetary system does work. Uh, we, I remember going back, Greta, to uh, when Paul Ryan was chair of the budget committee and even before that and, and all of these forecasts of gloom and doom about, oh, we're going to uh, accumulate so much debt and interest rates are going to crowd out all other spending. Well, we basically doubled the national debt from the recession in 2009 until uh, uh, last year before the pandemic. <clears throat> and none of the things that people uh, warned would happen happened. We didn't have inflation. We uh, had record low interest rates rather than higher interest rates. And the dollar was trading within normal uh, levels vis-a-vis -vis other currencies. So I think a lot of economists now are, are, have begun to say, wait a minute, uh, uh, maybe we've been thinking about debt in entirely the wrong way. And even, even uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell has basically said, we have the fiscal space to do what we need to do right now to make the investments we need to make to build the kind of economy for the future that we all hope we'll have. Well, why are people wrong about this and how should we be thinking about debt and deficits? Well, I, 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 I don't get any royalties from this, but I would flog a book called The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton, um, an economist and professor. Um, and it's become quite a bestseller, actually. And what she says is that if you look at the, the total national debt, $28 trillion right now is the, what we, we think of as the national debt. She said, don't think of it as debt. Think of it as all the money that the federal government has invested in the country over our history minus taxes. And that's really what it is. I mean, tw th those $28 trillion didn't exist uh, before the federal government issued them. And so the federal government has the ability to create, uh, create money, create uh, financing, and that's what we've been doing, we'll continue to do. The thing that I am so impressed about uh, from the Biden administration is that they're reversing decades and decades of our asking questions in the wrong order. Uh, historically, what we've always done is said, what can we afford to do? And that's not the right question. The right question is, what do the American people need us to do? And that's, that question becomes the first question. Once you've answered that, then you say, how do you, how do you resource that, uh, that need? And that's not just money, that's also capacity. So, for instance, uh, there's a $225 billion investment in child care in the American Families Plan, uh, and but you can't just say we're going to give $225 billion to people to pay for their child care. 
because there's not enough capacity. So what you would do is you'd make a false promise to the people and then you would drive the price of existing child care even higher. So what you have to do is spend part of that money on building capacity so that uh, there's enough child care to actually uh, service the people who need it. So again, there are just very different ways of thinking about money and I understand why m most people don't understand this concept because they think of it in their own framework, which is their household, which is you can't borrow so much money that you can't pay back. Um, but that's not the position that the federal government's in. Congressman, are you saying we can just print more money and there's no consequences? There could be consequences if there is too, too much inflation. So let me give you a, a hypothetical. We could say uh, that we're going to give every American family a $200,000 voucher to buy a house. We could, we could create the money to do that, but what would happen? Well, there's not enough housing, so the prices of existing houses would go through the roof, no pun intended, uh, and again, you'd be creating a false promise, but you, meanwhile, you'd, you'd drive up the housing market to uh, un unsustainable levels. So there is a limit as to how much money we can inject into the economy. The thing about the rescue plan, and here's where I think uh, Kevin Hearn makes a mistake, is he said $6 trillion uh, family, uh, the family, uh, American Families Plan and Job Plan, it's not quite that much, but that's over eight to ten years. So uh, the six billion, the six trillion dollar budget that the president proposed actually would have been 5.7 trillion if you had had no American Jobs Plan or American Rescue Plan, because only 300 billion of that is in fiscal year 22. So again, you've got to realize these are numbers that are very large, of course, but they're spread out over a number of years, and that's why I think uh, the Fed chair and others have said, uh, we have the fiscal space to do this because injecting this over a period of time will not cause the kind of inflation that uh, is dangerous. Respond to this headline. It's on Fox News' uh, website, and they're quoting mm -hmm. the Tax Foundation in a study that they say found the president's six trillion budget would cause U.S. economy to shrink by one percent over the next ten years and cost the economy about 165,000 jobs. That's a uh, that's an interesting projection. I don't know how you shrink the economy when you're adding that much money to it, uh, but uh, I'd like to read that analysis. Where, will your budget line up? Will it mirror President Biden's budget in every way? Not in every way. I think what we're doing right now is we're meeting with uh, all the committee chairs and with our various caucuses to get their input as to what they want to see in a budget resolution. Uh, and then uh, on a separate track, we're trying to decide exactly what would go into the reconciliation instructions that we will be a part of that budget resolution. And of course, reconciliation instructions, that's the process by which you can pass something in the Senate with a simple majority and not, uh, si not 60 votes. So um, those decisions haven't been made. I suspect that a lot of what's in the, in the president's budget will find its way into our final budget resolution. I think it'll track fairly closely, but there'll be, there'll be some definite changes because our, our members are pretty independent thinkers. They have their own ideas as well. And do you suspect that the president's two infrastructure proposals also mm -hmm. make it into the budget? Well, what we're doing is we're assuming that there will be no bipartisan deal on infrastructure uh, in the Senate. And if, uh, so we're proceeding as if all of the American Jobs Plan and all of the American Families Plan will be in the, in the reconciliation instructions that we send to the Senate and that we instruct our own committees to, to do. Uh, so if they, but if they come up with an, uh, a bipartisan deal, let's say it's a trillion dollars or almost a trillion dollars, we would just take that out of the, the reconciliation instructions. So we, neither process precludes the other. We hope that they do. The Senate does reach a bipartisan agreement on, on what we think of as hard infrastructure and uh, let, the, uh, let the rest of it be done by reconciliation. We'll go to Tom in Lancaster, California, Republican. You're up first. Good morning. Good, good morning. I'd like to talk about, you know, the, the never-ending deals with China. That's all you guys do. Is you work for China. We get everything's made in China now, and you, you, you sit here and lie to the American people. You're going to do a continuing resolution like you've done for the last forever. You don't work for the citizens. 
What about the Wulan Lab? When are you guys going to have a, a hearing on the, the 600,000 American citizens that were killed by the Communist Chinese Party? And Putin and Russia and China. All right, Tom, you got a lot there. John Yarman. <laughs> Well, let me let me start at the beginning. I don't know exactly what Tom thought I lied about. Uh, I was talking about the budget resolution reconciliation instructions. The appropriations process is a separate process. That's when we actually vote to spend, uh, to actually allocate dollars from uh, the Treasury to uh, the various departments, uh, Defense Department, Homeland Security, Justice Department, et cetera. Um, there's a very good chance that that would be the case, that we would end up doing a continuing resolution sometime uh, before the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30th. But uh, we're going to pass all of our appropriations bills in the House in July, and hopefully the Senate will move as well, and we can, we can come to an agreement. We have, we have been stuck over the last few years, by, primarily because uh, we've had uh, different. We have not had one party control over uh, the Congress and the White House, so it was very difficult to get uh, agreement on appropriations bills and and uh, uh, avoid a, a continuing resolution. Uh, but uh, we're going to try. Uh, we may not make it, uh, but the continuing resolution would be something that would be not for the entire fiscal year. It would probably be a month or two in duration, so we could have a, just a little more time to, to come to an agreement. Uh, uh, the rest of it, I, uh, I don't think I want to deal with uh, Chinese labs and, and those types of things. Uh, we'll let Tom uh, ask that of somebody else. All right, I'm, Scott. I'm in charge of the Budget Committee, not, uh, not the uh, Center for Disease Control. Scott, Thomasville, Georgia, Republican. Good morning. You, you made the comment that uh, most people look to the perspective of their own household and it's not it doesn't have the the government does not have the same limits. Right. I do agree. There's certainly a big difference between households and the government itself. However, you know, the government does have limits and because the government doesn't have any more money than the people have. And so there, there are limited resources. That's not what people don't like to talk about that anymore. We can just do whatever we want to. And I can tell you, inflation is here. There is a beach that I uh, went to almost on a monthly basis last, last year at this very time, and it was $300 a, a, a night. Now it's $850 a night. Along with that, we, we know in South Georgia we have limits as far as who we can hire. People are not wanting to work. You are having to pay more money to get them. And there is, there is too much money supply already. Uh, I agree. I think we need an infrastructure plan. Let's do it. But as far as trying to artificially pump up and have some kind of artificial jobs deal, the, the private sector has plenty of jobs. We don't need to create jobs. If we need something done, let's do it. But let's just don't create something to create something. Thank okay. you. Oh, I, I totally agree with, with that last comment. Uh, if you're going to spend money uh, at the federal level, if you're going to make investments, they need to be uh, meaningful and important investments, and they have to actually add to the economic uh, capacity of the, of the economy. Uh, and that's what I think uh, the American Rescue Plan and the American Families Plan do. Uh, but, no, we, we can't just throw money uh, at, uh, at, worthless, uh, at worthless projects. And, uh, but let me go back to one comment you made, and that is that uh, we don't have any more money than the people have. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we do have the printing presses. And, you know, I hate to, to use that term, of printing money, but we do. And if you think about it, we've been accumulating debt in the United States for most of our 230-year history. Uh, and how did we do that? That's because the government <laughs> issued a lot of money over time. And uh, nobody's ever been asked to pay off any of that national debt. Um, you know, we've been able to, to finance our debt when we needed to. And uh, I think that it will remain that way. Again, the, the constraint on us is, is rampant inflation. And I don't know about uh, going from 300 to $800 for a room, but a lot of the inflation you're seeing now is pandemic related, not demand related. And it also, the numbers are a little bit, uh, distorted because the numbers we saw in April and May uh, for the last two months 
were compared to last April and May, which was the depth of the pandemic. That was when everything shut down. So clearly, uh, as you emerge from that pandemic, uh, you know, people weren't going anywhere, so they didn't buy gas. Now gas prices are up. Uh, people weren't flying, and uh, now they are. So uh, airline tickets have gone up. Uh, so a lot of that's related to, to the, again, the comparison between last spring and now. And uh, that'll continue for a while. I don't think there's any question about that. The other things that uh, at the opening of the show, uh, uh, Chair, Fed Chair uh, Jay Powell talked about bottlenecks. Uh, I hear all the time the, the port situation, people who the, the ships are lining up to get into ports. Uh, you can't find containers to actually ship. There's a shortage of that. So the, the businesses are not being able to get the supplies that they need to uh, uh, to build their products. I was talking, I have a, a, the General Electric uh, appliance business based in my district, and they were talking to me yesterday about how the supply chain has really disrupted their business because they can't get parts. We know about uh, semiconductors, and we I have two Ford plants in my district, and they've had to shut down because they, um, they can't get semiconductors for their um, to build their vehicles. And so there, there are a lot of problems that I think are more situational and in, in, uh, not re again, not related to, uh, to federal spending, but related to other complexities around the world. So hopefully, and I think a lot of economists think that will play itself out over the next few months and, and that next year will, year will be fairly back to close to normal on, in terms of uh, inflation. Charles, you're next in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Independent. Hey, good morning. Morning. You know, I've, I've noticed this big inconsistency or dichotomy on the left and their view of our politics. You know, on the one hand, for environmental reasons, we're supposed to restrict behavior of people, i.e. burning fossil fuels and burning gasoline in our cars and using less energy. And then on the other hand, for the individual, the left is say, we're going to give you a guaranteed lifestyle. You can do whatever you want, and the government will always step in and take care of you. And for an example, illegitimate childbirth. That's the big problem in our country is family formation. You know, young ladies go out, get themselves pregnant, have a baby. They don't have any money. They don't know, they're not educated. So what does the leftist say? That's okay. We'll give you everything. We will take care of you. We will give you education. We will take care of your children. And there is a limit. I sincerely believe that mankind is entering the era of overpopulation. There, we do not have unlimited resources. We okay. cannot give. Charles, we understand your point. We'll have the congressman respond. <laughs> well, first of all, I would say it, uh, that it's interesting you say that since uh, right now a lot of demographers are, are complaining about the fact that population growth is, is at seriously low levels in the country. And, and we're, we, we are worrying in the United States and, and other countries are too about having enough people in the country. And uh, again, I think we had the, the lowest growth in, in birth rate uh, in 50, 60 years just this past year. So I don't think the facts actually support uh, your theory. And, and I will say two things about uh, s what you might call uh, uh, Social Security spending, not Social Security program. Uh, you know, um, why would a woman who wants to have a child without getting married not be entitled to have the same support for a child from someone who does and so we educate children uh, because there are our future population and there are future tax base and it's the moral thing to do we don't educate them based on what family they came from uh, and uh, again I think this is a it's definitely a a different way of thinking between Democrats and and others uh, but I'm comfortable being on the side that wants to take care of our children and wants to treat all of our citizens, whether they're married or not, with the same level of compassion and support. Taylor, Chevy Chase, Maryland, Democratic caller. Hey, thanks for having me on. And I think your answer to that last question was just fantastic. Um, so I have a, a, a two-part kind of co one comment quickly is that, um, you know, you guys won with, you know, clear majority and uh, 
you know, kind of a mandate. And I, I'm proud that Democrats are finally kind of moving away from bipartisanship. Um, do you think with this double infrastructure bill that the, you know, how the, the second one, are you going to be able to get people like Senator Manchin to agree to a tax raise? Are you going to pass the first one bipartisan and then kind of be left hanging, you know, uh, electric vehicle charging and the other kind of climate related uh, ones in the second in the second bill are going to be you know left trying to figure out how to do that uh, while Democrats or while Republicans are going to be able to be cheering their win. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's right. I think uh, if there is a bipartisan deal on on uh, the Republican version of infrastructure, which is roads, bridges, water systems, broadband, airports, and ports, uh, but not human infrastructure, uh, if there's a bipartisan deal on that, we will pass it um, uh, with a great deal of satisfaction. And uh, I hope they do that. But all the rest of the, the what we call infrastructure, the human infrastructure part, uh, things like two years of early childhood education, which in my opinion is the most important thing we can do for our, for our future besides deal with climate change, um, elder care, a lot of those issues, those will have to be done by, um, by reconciliation, by the budget process. And uh, we will be, so it's a true, true potentially a, a, a parallel process, uh, but yes, it, if we get a bipartisan deal, we'd be happy with that. We'll do the rest of it by uh, reconciliation. If we don't get a bipartisan deal, we'll all do it all by reconciliation. Sue in New Jersey wants to know, sir, shouldn't we at least try to live within our means or risk another bubble? I'm not comfortable with China <laughs> owning our debt. What happens when they call it due? Okay, um, glad you asked that question. China owns $1 trillion roughly of U.S. Treasuries. That's it. If they, if uh, they said they wanted a tr uh, trillion dollars instead of a trillion dollar treasuries, we would put a trillion dollars on their account and that would be fine. And then they could do with, with, with that whatever they wanted. They could leave it here, they could take it home. Uh, we can do that with anybody. But tr China, the, the emphasis on China owning our debt is, is way overplayed because again, it's, it's a fraction, it's less than 5% of the debt. Hebel in San Diego, Republican. Oh, uh, thank you so much for taking my call. Uh, um, yeah, um, I'm wondering. Oh, I'm reading a tweet. Nope, nope. <laughs> you're on. You're on, sir. You're on. You're watching the television. Good. Just go ahead with your yeah, question or comment. I, I am, but no. I, I was wondering if the congressman, um, how much money do you think you have in your bank account? I mean, I have <laughs> money on my retirement and everything. Right. Like a, so, w w what are you doing? Six trillion dollars. Do you have any idea what six trillion dollars is? Um, yeah, I, I have an idea what it is. Uh, it's, it's it's a lot of money. It's a lot more than I have in my bank account. But again, what I've said throughout this uh, appearance is, uh, we're not uh, we're not families at, at the federal level. We are not families. We've been borrowing money to service the the country, uh, to serve the people of this country for 230 years. And we'll continue to do that because the needs are more than we, we choose to tax our citizens. And you know the, the money we have, if we relied on taxation, purely on taxation to fund the government, then a lot of people would, uh, would suffer very, very seriously because we couldn't provide nearly the services that uh, the, the American people want us to provide. Tom in Stewart, Florida, Democratic caller. Hello. I just wonder, what, what do you? When uh, do we have to grow and grow and grow to be a, a, a healthier nation? We're using up finite resources. We got to stop uh, this crazy growth. What, what are we keeping up? Trying to keep up with the Chinese, and, and the Chinese. Uh, I think we would have had a world war, and we, we would all be dead if the Chinese didn't have a one-child family. Now they're going to go to a three-child family. You know, there are over a billion population over there in China. Are we trying to keep, uh, compete with them, with people? It just takes more resources, more people, more pollution. Okay, more Tom, understand. Congressman. Yeah, well, as, yeah, as I said just a few minutes ago, we actually are, uh, have, a, we're having, we have a declining birth rate in the country. So our country is not growing. Uh, we actually do need to grow it. Uh, we, can't, we can't stay where we are because uh, we, you know what the, the demographics of society are. Um, there are a lot of people like me 
who are about 10,000 a day who are turning 65 who are relying on Social Security and eligible for Medicare and uh, th there are not enough people replacing them in the workforce to pay for those programs. At, at, uh, at one point early on in Social Security there were 13 people working to support every Social Security beneficiary. Now that number is just slightly over one as I, as I understand it. So uh, we do need more people in the workforce right now. Um, Congressman, the, the book that you cited earlier from the professor, what was that? What's the name of that book again and the professor? It's, it's called The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton, K-E-L-T-O-N. Okay. And um, again, it, it, uh, it's not written for economists. It is written for ordinary citizens. It is very easy to read, very understandable. And uh, I, I think, again, when if it doesn't change your mind about thinking about money, it will make you think about it. And I, I've talked to a lot of people about the, the theory that she is writing about is called Modern Monetary Theory, MMT. And uh, uh, everybody I've talked to who's read the book and who's thought about it has said fundamentally she's absolutely right on the basics of the theory. Uh, and that I haven't, even the people who are skeptical of MMT say she didn't get anything wrong. So they, don't, they may not agree with the theory, but, she, but the, the basics, the foundation of her theory and others is, uh, is sound. And she's appeared on, on C-SPAN a, a couple of times. You can find her yeah. if you go to cspan.org. You can find discussions with her about her book. Right. Uh, and she's, she's been on a lot of programs you can find on YouTube and, and where in 20 minutes or so she explains the whole theory. Chairman John Yarmuth of the Budget Committee, Democrat of Kentucky, we appreciate our, our conversation with you as always this morning. Thanks, Greta. Good being with you.